everyone. How are you doing today? I have Sarah Stitch and Mommy here. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Nice to be uh, here. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm good. Glad sure. that you're here. So a little bit about Sarah before we get into the conversation. Sarah can be found on her YouTube channel, Stitch and Mommy. Of course, everything will be linked below. Her, you can also find her on Instagram, Stitch and Mommy. And she also has her Etsy store, which we'll talk a little bit about later towards the end of the episode that you can find on Etsy, Stitch and Mommy. So everything is Stitch <laughs> and Mommy. There might be a space in between the two for the YouTube channel. Probably, yeah. And, but and it'll be linked to below. Yeah, so yeah. just yeah. go to the links. Um, I'll mm -hmm. have it all uh, worked out for you. So anyways, let's talk a little bit about your early days in crafting. How did you get into all of your crafting adventures? I know you're more than just a cross stitcher. So, um, but let, we're primarily here for cross stitch, but we yes. can have about all of them. So <laughs> yeah. um, talk about, how did you get into crafting? Um, basically just born into a crafty family. So. Um, my mom is a knitter and a spinner, and she taught me how to sew as well. Um, the sewing machine I have was my maternal grandmother's sewing machine that she handed down to me. My paternal grandmother is the one who taught me how to cross stitch when I was in second grade. So I've learned how to knit and crochet, but promptly forgot, <laughs> and then learned again and promptly forgot. I've done plastic canvas, scrapbooking, sewing. I think I started counted cross stitch the first cross stitch i did was stamped cross stitch and i think mm -hmm. counted cross stitch started in like junior high and kind of took off from there and started sewing my own clothes like in eighth grade too so that kind of junior high time was when i started getting really really into crafts and sewing and kind of cross stitch came and went throughout you know life and but i always keep coming back to it as my first love <laughs> so i do sewing and scrapbooking are probably my top two other hobbies but cross stitch is number one <laughs> when when you started cross stitching you you said your grandmother was the one that taught you right yes okay yeah. do you remember what that first project was it is i i think i might have shown it in my whip parade like over a year ago but it was a handkerchief with some flowers on it and i actually lost it over the years and I found it again at some point. So I actually have it in my possession finished, you know, there was a pack of three stamped handkerchiefs and only one is done. Um, but that's the one I learned on. So it was my second grade project, <laughs> a little wonky, but yeah. And then, okay. So then you said you, you, it's been, it's been here and there and you haven't been consistently cross stitching all your life. So when when you've gotten back into it and now full force like as much as you are since you've been on floss too you know yeah. like think about when you got into it that you've been consistent since then um can you talk a little bit about that time that you really dived back into it and it's been so ingrained in your life like what brought you back to it and what has kept you in it? Um, I think like, I think junior high is when it started with the counter cross stitch and I would do like ornaments and kits and leisure arts books. And a lot of those were for other people and I would stitch for other people. Um, and so I don't have a lot of those. I have a few pictures that I've, you know, taken and a lot of that was pre-digital cameras too, so you don't really have record of that. Mm -hmm. But um, I did my first mirabilia in college. So like that was kind of the start of some more modern pieces, I guess. And <clears throat> once you get, at least for me, once I got hooked on mirabilias, I don't want to stop, you know? So I, I've done, I think six of those. So different ones, like I'd collect a pattern and, and not really start it until a point in my life where it was appropriate like well as soon as we have kids I'm gonna do this one because I want to hang it in a kids room but if I don't have kids I don't want to do it because then there's no room to put it you know so it was kind of so a few of those I'm like okay 
we're going to have kids now. Let's start this Mirabilia, you know, and then I'd work on it and put it up in the hallway, you know, so there was different things that would kind of motivate me to do another one and, um, or make gifts for people. I'm not sure when I started full coverage. It's probably been, I don't know, probably a good five or six years. I mean, since I've had, since I've been home because I did was in college and then worked part time. And since I've been home with my kids for the past 11 years, like I've had a little bit of free time in between the baby years. So that's the time when I'll get back into it. And now I have like 22 full coverage pieces. <laughs> so at some point I kind of fell off the deep end as far as that's concerned, but, and started more than I can handle, but <laughs> So you were talking there a little bit about your, your different types of projects. What kind, what is, how would you describe your, your project style, your, what your, what kind of projects you're into? Um, I think anything, like I like color. So a variety of color. I don't like things generally speaking that are muted tones or not very much color. So I like things that have a variety of colors. Um, like there's a piece, a kit my mom bought me probably 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, that was like a, it's practically full coverage and it's um, like a garden. So it's got a whole bunch of like probably a hundred colors in this kit. And so my mom was ticking all the boxes of like, it looks kind of like a Thomas Kincaid. It has a million colors. So she kind of knew my, my thing was colors. And so it's a little bit too many maybe, <laughs> but that's kind of my thing is like, yeah, I like things that are, you know, cheerful and happy. And so. so as far as the different types of projects that you like to stitch on, are you more, I know you had mentioned that you have a lot of full coverage pieces, but you also mm -hmm. stitch a variety of other projects. So you're not just necessarily all full coverage, right? So no, yeah. And that, the desire to stitch full coverage kind of comes and goes too. So it's kind of nice to have both. Um, and I have a good variety. And I know since I've, since I've been aware of the online community, it's, I've been able to, you know, become aware of new designers too. So I'm kind of wanting to try it, all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been dangerous, <laughs> but I do like, I don't know. I do like fancy ladies. Like my, um, in college, my, I had, was a home ec major with a clothing and textiles emphasis. So, and I made my own wedding dress and there's a lot of that. I used to want to be, you know, fashion designer or a wedding coordinator or things like that. Cause the big fancy dresses is always what caught my eye. So any design, like a lot of even the full coverage pieces I have are ladies in fancy dresses. So that's kind of like my thing <laughs> as well. So rather than sew them, and I have sewn a few big costumes that are poofy, but I think that's, if I can stitch them, it's a lot easier to, because uh, you really don't have anywhere to, to go <laughs> to wear a dress like that now. So a lot of the historical dresses are are fun to stitch, so. I'm yeah, I know. Sadly, that. I wish sometimes that those that kind of clothing would come back in style because I love the the True. suits that even the men wear because you know you right. the big neckties and <laughs> you know, the full the tails. Yeah, I know. Right. Uh, yeah. But you know, unless you're a movie star, you don't get to wear that kind of attire on a regular basis. That's true. It would be fun to be an extra or something sometime where you can. You know, you don't have to know how to act, but you can wear the fun clothes. <laughs> In a period piece, yeah. Yeah, definitely. yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. Um, so, let's talk about, okay, so you do, you do full coverage, you do small pieces, you, so you're more of like an eclectic stitcher because you have a variety, yeah. you know, you love the ladies and, and the, and the gowns, uh, you also are a designer, which we'll get to in a little bit. You can see <laughs> one of the pieces on the wall there. Uh, mm -hmm. So when it comes to a cross-stitch piece that you're working on, what, how, and you, you're, you're ready to start, what is your process for starting? 
do you as and how I mean that being do you just gather up everything that the the pattern prescribes and you're ready to go or does it depend upon the pattern or how do you go about Yeah. <laughs> Starting the project. You understand what I'm asking? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it does kind of vary depending on the pattern. Um, I do like to, to kit up like close to when I buy a pattern because I don't tend to like to stash for the sake of stashing. So like I've acquired a few patterns recently and I'm already thinking like what fabric can I go with that to have it ready? Like whether or not I start it right now is yet to be determined, but mm -hmm it's nice to have something to go together and to be ready. And I have, I have all the DMC in a master set that I just work from my master set. So if it's a full coverage or um, most pieces, I'm not going to convert, you know, I'll just go, I won't need to kit that up. I'll just go straight to my DMC. Um, lately I've been doing a little bit more converting. So I'll, you know, start looking through my fancy floss and figuring out what colors I want to do and have to have that all kind of sorted out before I start stitching. And it, it can change once you start stitching and you see what it looks like, but um, I do like for a mirabilia, I do like to have everything ahead of time. So I'll have the threads and the crinic and the beads and everything all kind of in a little bag ready to go. Cause I do like to do all that stuff as I go. Um, I stitch in hand, so there's nothing stopping me. No frames or cue snaps to stop me from beating as I go. So I like to have everything ready at the very beginning. So you had mentioned converting, which was kind of what I was getting at in that question. <laughs> so when in a roundabout way. So when you when you convert and you're sitting down, you have this vision of how you would like to see your project mm -hmm. finished. Are you one to start with? the fabric first and then build on top of that with the flosses do you start with the flosses and go to the fabric do you start with a main color floss and then build the flosses around that main color how do you go about converting your projects um i've only done it a few times but i think i do generally start with the fabric um the one piece i did that's the joy that was a Christmassy piece. I changed it to be for my mom. That one, I kind of started with the color of the thread because I knew I wanted it to be teal and I just put it on white. So, but most of them I have like, I want this to be on like the Nora Corbett fairies. I knew I had some color and cotton fabric for one of them. I went with the called for fabric on the other one. So I wanted to make sure they would match the fabric and everything would like, work together with each thread but also work together on the fabric so i think the fabric is probably the base that i start with and and um and go from there i'm trying to think what else i've converted well the little the little falling leaves like 40 count silk gauze like the mm -hmm. fabric isn't really a consideration so that was just how can i use these color and cotton threads i was gifted you know because i wanted to which ones go together and look like leaves so it kind of does depend on the on the pattern, design, but yeah. I think I do like to start with the fabric. Yeah. And then, so okay, so then, and then, if you okay, if once you get that fabric, then do you start with one main color, and then that you have like with your mom? Okay, so your mom's joy uh, design. You had you knew that it was going to be teal. So then, did right. you the, did you change the other colors to match that teal color? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. So I had like, I have my, my floss box. <laughs> so I just like, I pull it out and I look at all of them and like, what colors do I want to use? And then I also use my charting software sometimes if I want to use like, I, I found a color I like and I'll look it up in the software to find out what name it is. Mm -hmm. And I'll search in the software for other things with that name because they're not always necessarily in the same number range because I have my floss organized by numbers. so. I can see, oh, there's more like pistachio green in this other color number range. So let's go look at some of those. And that helps too, to like use my eyes and the software to kind of find okay. colors that, that look together, that work together. So 
That's interesting because yeah. I've never not heard of any other anybody else do that. But that you know that yeah. is an interesting way of doing that. And if you don't have software and you wanted to try that, I'm sure uh, there are lists that of mm -hmm. the that you can yeah. find with the, the list name. Yeah. That you, could, yeah. you could definitely do that with. Yeah, probably online. There's a list somewhere mm -hmm. of what DMC calls everything. So yeah, but that that is a fun way to do it. Like especially if. I'll kind of sometimes I'll type in my what I think a color should be like burgundy or whatever and I'll you won't come up with anything because maybe DMC doesn't have anything called burgundy so then you have to get creative and I'll just scroll through all the reds and find well this shade is kind of what I want oh it's claret you know and the, like whatever they're going to sure. call it and so you got to get creative sometimes to figure out what they call stuff or oh that's a different kind of blue I hadn't thought of that color you know mm -hmm. so I use I use my box and I use my program to, for the DMC, if it's fancy floss, I just, it's what I have in my box. I can't really do any more than that. Cause I don't, I could go down to my LNS and just stand there and stare at the threads, but um, I haven't done that yet. So. Sure. Excellent. Yeah. So then let's talk, let's, let's change uh, tracks here a little bit and go into floss tube. So you've been stitching for, you've been stitching for most of your life off and mm -hmm. on. What brought you to the wonderful world of YouTube? Um I think it was I guess it's probably been over 2 years now. I started an Instagram account that was public just for my stitching because I figured um I had a little bit more time to devote to my shop with my kids getting older and thought that could be a fun way to get my get myself out there and because I had a private Instagram account but I thought well if I make a public one that's just for stitching then that might be a a good way to expose myself to more people and then I found all these other stitchers <laughs> so many people and and then just started hearing people talk about videos I'm like what is this you know and went and started watching people and just kind of fell down that rabbit hole and it wasn't for another like probably nine months before I decided to make one um but i think it was um ann p i don't know if you know her mm -hmm. um who was the final push to to get have the courage to do it because she's kind of a mellow personality as well that's not flashy and you know she's just kind of down to earth and shares what she's working on i'm like i can do that if she can do that i can do that so um i asked my husband and he's like he would never ever in a million years get in front of a camera. <laughs> so he's like, why would you want to do that? But I, the more I watched other people, the more I wanted to. And so I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to try it. And here we are. It's been like a year and a half. So it's been going well. So <laughs> that's all. Well, I think that's how many people start in, in, on YouTube is because I never said, I, I said I would never do that either. Yeah. <laughs> I would never ever go out on public media like that. And yeah. Well, at, at first, that's what you think. At first, you're like, really? But then you notice, like, a good chunk of the people making these videos are introverts, and they're not the sort of people that would be, you know, on public media in any other form, you know? But I think it's this community is so encouraging and welcoming that it helps those of us that are not super outgoing that we can still participate and, you know, be welcomed and exactly and as long as you're talking to yourself and not talking to a room full of people it's a lot easier so <laughs> yeah. so how has floss tube changed your method of stitching or your style of stitching it has changed a little bit um i i'm a lot more consistent now um stitching like every day practically like before it would come and go and I'd go in waves of lots of stitching and other crafts and lots of stitching and other crafts um and now it's a lot more consistent because you feel obligated kind of to have something to show or you just have set your own goals and you want to finish them so and then like I mentioned earlier like people sharing new designers that I hadn't heard of and and like these like primitive type stuff, like my uh, snowflower diaries. Um, 
never would have considered anything like that. And I'm still not necessarily drawn to primitive pieces or rep reproduction samplers. That's not really my thing. But doing a little bit <clears throat> was kind of a nice change, you know, to just kind of dabble in that a little bit. Um, planning, too, is something I never did before, which people might find <laughs> interesting to know, because that's something I'm known for on my channel is planning and changing my plans. Yeah, but, we were going to go there. <laughs> yeah, I never, I never did that before, before floss tube. So, like, knowing how many whips I had, I like, people kept saying how many they had. I'm like, I don't know, how many do I have? So I had to get my boxes out and flip through everything and realize just how many I had. <laughs> so. Okay, so you had mentioned, let's, we hit on a few things there that I want to <laughs> Okay, firstly, let's go back a little bit to the fact that you had said that you have like 22 full coverage pieces. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have one. Yeah. And it overwhelms <laughs> me sometimes. That's true. How yeah. do you keep 22 pieces going and not feel overwhelmed? I mean, um, some of your pieces are like, yeah massive so the smallest one is like this big but then the biggest one is yeah probably like 900 so, stitches wide but i guess obviously you are a process stitcher and not mm -hmm. necessarily a product stitcher for sure yeah like i do like finishes but especially those full coverage pieces most of them i don't see going in my house anywhere <laughs> because they're just my flavor you know they're not my husband's flavor so they're more just to keep me entertained you know through the through my life so i'm not really my goal isn't necessarily to finish them it's just to work on them so it's fun to slowly see things progress so i'm not necessarily there's a couple of them i do want to see finished because they're either for people or for our home but most of them are just for fun so I guess that's how I can justify that. <laughs> do you then have more, do you feel more internal pressure to, I know you, I know you allude to this on your channel, but do you personally have more pressure to, or do you put more pressure on yourself to work on those ones that you want to put in your house? Or is it really just because you are a process stitcher, you don't, pressure yourself on any of them does that um, make sense it does and it's okay. kind of it, it comes and goes like <clears throat> if there's like i don't know like we had for example the waterfall yosemite mm -hmm. piece that i'm working on like that's probably the number one one i think my husband would be fine putting up um i I've had points where, okay, I know it could go on this wall. I need to work on it. And then I would get like, oh, wait, let's do monogamous May instead of stitch mania. And like, and then I start freaking out and backpedaling. No, I can't do that. I'm going to burn out and hate the piece. And then we change our plans for that room. We're like, well, and now I don't need to stitch it in any hurry. So back into the closet it goes. And then we talk more and like, oh, yeah, it could go on this wall. Oh, well, back out of the closet it goes, you know, so. So, I don't know. You're, I, so your constant planning <laughs> constantly changes yeah. your pressure. So yes. it really has no bearing on yeah. your process. I recently calculated it. And even if I did a page a month, and there's smaller pages in Heaven and Earth Designs. If I did a page a month, it would still take me almost three years to finish it. So there's a lot more pages in that piece than I realized. So that's kind of depressing, but um, I kind of want to put more focus on that, but I don't, I also don't want to burn out and hate it. So sure. it's, I might try, try different plans to see what sticks and if it takes me five years, it takes me five years, you know, but we'll see. Yeah. But you're in it for the fun and the enjoyment. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. There okay. was there was a piece I made for my husband's friend that was a Superman full coverage and it it probably stretched out longer than it should have because of other things that came in to to take my interest away but I kept coming back to it and focusing on it a lot because I knew it needed to be done, you know. So 
there is there is more pressure if it's if there's a goal on something mm -hmm. to get it so yeah plans <laughs> a big portion of your videos is often talking about your plans mm -hmm. or talking about how your plans have changed right but that's a bad thing because we all have <laughs> things to have you know we plan something and we all know plans always change yep so and then you just mentioned how prior to floss two you were not a planner now is that just you were not a planner for cross stitch or you were not a planner in general in life hmm probably just cross stitch because i i mean i'm somewhat organized <laughs> in my life like my my desk is kind of a mess but in general like I'll, i have a calendar and i write stuff down all the time and but um and those plans don't usually change but i think because it's cross stitching and it's fun you know you're you give yourself the grace to change them and they're not set in stone always write your plans in pencil because they can be erased <laughs> But yeah, I think before I would just kind of stitch whatever I was feeling like stitching at the time. And which can be bad for those older whips because you just forget they're back there in the mm -hmm. closet. And so if you haven't worked on them recently, then they might as well not exist. So having a list of what I've started is helpful because then I remember they're there and I can go back and like pull them in and you know get them worked on so plans have helped in that way to like come remind like bringing those old ones back out remembering why i started them in the first place so do you have a like okay so when you're planning things are you actually sitting there with a pencil and paper and sitting down and writing things down or are you actually sitting there while you're stitching and you're like oh i could do this and then as you're thinking about it you write it down like, do you actually um, sit down and block out a set of time and like, oh, you know, and you plan, you block it all out? Do you want a little bit of both? Like stitching while I'm stitching or watching floss tube, things will you know pop into my head. But I do have a a physical planner and I have multiple Excel spreadsheets. So there will be times when I just get the bug to plan, and so whatever I plan to stitch that day doesn't get a whole lot of time because I'll end up spending an hour or two on my Excel spreadsheet playing with, you know, full coverage fanatic themes or ch charting out all of next year and like what I want to plug in each month in this category, you know, so I will kind of have spurts of planning where I'll sit down and play and then I'll come back to it and be like, what was I thinking? I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> but I do have my like monthly one, which helps me with the little dates because then I can like look at it every day and see like what I had planned. I usually plan like right out a month in advance so I know kind of what I don't have to think about it on that day. I can just know this is what I want to this is what I've already set for myself so I'll, I'll go do that. Um, and like I remember Brian Blitzstitch mentioning that where it takes some of the like if you if you decide take too long to decide what you're working on then you don't get as much stitching time. So mm -hmm. just being told, like being told what to do by a previous plan is kind of helpful sometimes. Like today is your day to work on this. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> so it's kind of nice to have a plan like that. But I do, I do get the planning bug every once in a while and spend a lot of time either with my pencil or my computer. So. <laughs> Okay, so we had mentioned <clears throat> that you are a designer and your Etsy store is Stitch and Mommy. Mm -hmm. And you have been designing for quite a while now. But you have become pretty famous for your uh, uh, temperature. What do we call them? Temperature logs. Temperature. Yeah. This one's, I just named it Temperature Garden just because garden. it's a little sure. garden. So, There's a lot of temperature things out there. Yeah. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about how you got into designing Crossage? Okay. Um, well, I had my, my Etsy shop open, I think I opened it 10 years ago, and it was mainly to resell, or not to resell, to sell 
finished works that I didn't want anymore. Um, and that seemed to be pretty successful at the time. And I would make doll clothes as well. So it kind of went through different phases. And at one point, someone requested a poem to be designed as, and stitched as a cross stitch. And so I designed it and stitched it for them. And then in the course of just a few months, I had two more people who had seen the listing and wanted it stitched for them too. So on my third time stitching this piece, I'm like, you know what? I should probably just sell the pattern because I don't want to keep stitching it. It seems to be popular. I've stitched it three times now. Um, that one was charted on graph paper, um, pencil and paper. And so I invested in software and charted up that on actual software and started offering PDFs. And until the temperature garden, that was my most popular design, the babies don't keep poem. But I have since taken a few other customer requests and made those into patterns. And if they're generic, you know, opened them up to the general public as well after I've stitched them for my, the original person. Um, and then I've charted Bible verses and other inspirational pieces as well. Cause that's, so that's kind of started to be my thing was like text based mm -hmm. patterns. And then that temperature one just kind of happened. I saw somebody who made some flowers, temperature flowers, but they, I felt like, and I even started stitching it. I had like a couple petals done. And I was like, this is too big. These petals are taking too long to have one every day to have to stitch. And the format, I, I had issues with the format. So I'm like, you know what? I can make my own. Why don't I just do that? <laughs> that fits, fits all of my criteria. And, and it ended up being pretty, pretty popular. So that was fun. Yes. So just to clarify for those that might not have watched Sarah before, as the temperature garden. So each petal is a different day, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then each flower is a different week of the month or of yeah, the kinda, year. Kind of sort of. Yeah. So roughly there's, there's like four to six petals on every flower. To pick. So each garden is the exact amount of days in that month. So it's, you know, so it's each, each, each month has 30, 31, 28, you know, however many five to six has. flowers. Yeah. Most okay. of them are five petals and there's an occasional six and four thrown in there just for, and it makes it unique too. So it's not just all the same kind of flower. <laughs> yeah. It's not monotonous. Yeah. 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 Very nice. And there's also another, there's a, there's a temperature quilt available mm -hmm. correct that yeah and and she's currently working on a temperature p uh, pattern for <laughs> 2019 yeah so be on the lookout for that in the coming months for hopefully weeks. before the end of the year yeah yes. i'd like to get it out so that is exciting so yeah. good luck with that so how has Maybe it hasn't, but how, how has your designing influenced your stitching? Hmm. I don't know, like, I, I like, I like backstitching, which a lot of my designs have backstitched letters. Um, and, Coming into the online world, I've discovered that a lot of people hate backstitching, which was kind of mm -hmm. revolutionary to me because I started stitching in the 90s when backstitch was everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so it made, I don't know if it affected my stitching necessarily, but I think the online community kind of affected my designing. So maybe floss tube and yeah, yeah, social media has infl okay, influence, okay, yeah, and maybe limiting some backstitch on some patterns because so, some people aren't fond of it um but yeah i don't know i don't know that it necessarily changed my stitching because i do know that I'll, at the at the beginning i was designing pieces that i would be okay stitching if somebody asked me and wanted to pay me to stitch it because i knew backstitching is fast so if you have backstitch words versus stitched words it's going to go faster um i liked the look and it was quick to stitch so that was kind of part of the philosophy behind why I would choose certain designs is um, if someone were to request me to stitch this, would I want to, you know, cause some things 
if it's really heavily stitched, they're not going to understand, well, it's going to take me six months to make that. <laughs> Do you really want to charge me? You know, you really can't ask people to, to spend that kind of money um, on, on stitching. And it's just the way it is. It's kind of an undervalued hobby because you don't really realize how long it takes to, to do stuff so um but my regular stitching you know i can do as many as much it can take as long as it wants you know so i don't know if you it, can do as much back stitching as you want exactly <laughs> that's true <laughs> well my last question that i ask everybody is if there's somebody on the fence about starting a YouTube channel or, you know, going onto social media or maybe even starting a design store studio or for, and they're on the fence. Do you have any words of wisdom, words of advice for them? Um, I guess just, I don't know, like maybe just not to be afraid of if it's a video situation, you know, not be afraid of, putting yourself out there because we're a pretty welcoming community and I know not all genres of videos can be that way but the stitching community seems to be and you'll be accepted with open arms and you don't have to be outgoing to get in front of the camera um, for designing um, just design what you like and I think other people there's enough people with a variety of tastes that there's going to be somebody that likes what you do or what you show um, so you don't necessarily have to design what you think will be popular. I guess I mean there's 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 kind of a crossover. You wanna you wanna be relevant, I guess, and somewhat modern, but also make sure you're enjoying it too and it reflects you. So so include a little backstitching if you like to backstitch. <laughs> Is it, you know, or include words if you like words or. No, I definitely agree. I think you, you. Have, yeah. you need to have an element yeah. of yourself because that's right. what people are looking for. You, you need to have <clears throat> any designer in any kind of aspect has a signature. Yeah. Or a, you know, something that points them out that that is a, you know, a Stitch and Mommy exclusive or a. <laughs> or you know a michael kors or you know some kind of thing that is specific to their brand right so, yeah. yeah no i completely yeah. agree that you need to you need to do what makes you happy and what is yours you know have some element of your style in it yeah and and fads will come and go you know and you can appeal to that a little bit but not be afraid to just stitch what you like and design what you like and there will always be people that also like that you know so it's kind of a yeah yeah excellent well i want to <laughs> thank you so much for coming on today i had such a blast yeah i hope you had fun <laughs> i think so yeah so it's kind of it'll sink in afterwards <laughs> but yeah yeah no i i had a, i had a great time and i hope you did as well and i hope all of you did and of course we will be back in another two weeks for another wonderful episode. You can find Sarah on her channel for regular updates. I think she's doing mm -hmm. weekly now, right? Right now, yeah. Or pretty much weekly, up yeah. weekly updates. And so Stitch and Mommy, you can find her on Instagram and Etsy at Stitch and Mommy. And go and give her some love, check out her patterns and watch her videos. So thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> and we'll see you in, in a couple weeks. And don't forget to always, be creative. Creative. <laughs> See you guys later.